Well, I want to welcome everyone to the 11th Annual Public Lecture in Native Health at Western Carolina University here in Cullowhee, North Carolina. WCU sits on the homeland of the Cherokee people in Western North Carolina. We acknowledge the ancestors of the Cherokee who lived here for more than 12,000 years and those who are still here, thriving and resilient. We are honored to share their legacy of curiosity, learning, and science. And at this time, it is customary to ask an elder for an opening prayer. So I'd like to call on one of our distinguished speakers, Mr. Reno Red Cloud Oglala Lakota. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Oglala Sioux Tribe in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. I'm with the Great Sioux Nation, Seven Fires, Oketi, uh, Shakui, Lakota. So we're, we're with the Oglala Sioux Band. I'd just like to say a little prayer for all of us today. Tonkashila, grandfather. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our families, our children, our elderly, ones that are sick, that you could heal them. Just want to uh, thank, bless us today for our communication on our one of our most sacred gifts, and which is water. So we could come together and discuss it and try to protect and preserve it for our present and our future generations. Take care of us on this day, keep us safe, and that we have a good discussion today and meeting. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Red Cloud. I uh, just want to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Leffler. I'm director of the culturally based native health programs in the College of Health and Human Sciences at WCU. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Turner, Dr. Turner Goins and Pam Myers for their time and energy in making this year's lecture possible. This year's lecture is made possible through one of Dr. Goins grants funded from the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities of the National Institutes of Health. Since 2005, our Native Health programs here at WCU has offered a fully online certificate in Native Health at both the graduate and undergraduate levels. The courses were developed in collaboration with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and were created to assist health providers and others working with Native communities and understanding more about the history, culture, and issues impacting the health of Native people. We also organized the annual Rooted in the Mountain Symposium, created to integrate traditional knowledge, health, and environmental issues. We have facilitated the dialogue of Native peoples and local community members with scientists, writers, health providers, environmentalists, artists, agriculturalists, and a myriad of others to better understand our common ground. This year, we are excited and honored to bring to you four speakers who have worked tirelessly to improve the health of people and their natural resources. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Anna Nahashin. She is a physician epidemiologist with a specialty in preventative medicine and public health. She is professor of environmental health sciences at Columbia University and director of Columbia University Superfund Research Program. Her goals are contributed to the reduction of environmental health disparities in underserved and disproportionately exposed communities to improve population health. She collaborates with a strong heart study, a study of cardiovascular disease and risk and its risk factors in American Indian communities, and the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, a study of cardiovascular and lung disease in urban settings across the U.S. Her research investigates the long-term health effects of environmental exposures, their interactions with genetic and epigenetic variants, and effective interventions for reducing involuntary exposures. Today, she will share with us her research pertaining to medical, metal uh, contaminants, water quality, and cardiovascular health in Native American communities. After Dr. Uh, Navas Ashin's talk, we will ask our three panelists to offer their insight and to speak to their work uh, being conducted in their communities. 
Our panelists are Heather Gregory, who works with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians Wastewater Treatment Plant in the Water Quality Laboratory, where she helps educate the community on various environmental issues. Um, her focus areas of interest are chemistry, hydrology, microbiology, and wetland science. Her work is grant funded by the EPA and works accordingly under the EPA Section 106 Clean Water Act. Our next panelist is uh, Reno Red Cloud Sr. He's sixth generation descendant of the Oglala Lakota Chief Red Cloud. He works as a Natural Resources Regulatory Agency Water Resources Department Director with the Oglala Sioux Tribe Environmental Tribal Program. He is also a board member of the Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance, Oglala Sioux Tribe Environmental Health Technician Team, and Missouri River Recovery and Implementation Committee. He brings over 30 years experience working with different water programs and projects for the Oglala Sioux Tribe. He administers, manages, and enforces the water code for the protection and preservation of the Oglala Sioux Tribe groundwater and surface water resources. On Oglala Sioux Tribe's environmental team technician team, he assists in addressing and protecting natural resources from oil pipelines, uranium, and gold mining, especially in the sacred Black Hills. He is also a consultant with a strong heart study, water study for indigenous people. And then we have Dr. Tommy Rock, who is of the Navajo Nation. He received his doctorate at Northern Arizona University in Earth Science and Environmental Sustainability, and currently is a postdoc research associate in the field of environmental health at the University of Utah. Dr. Rock's research has studied traditional ecological knowledge in accessing the elevated levels of uranium in traditional indigenous food source, such as sheep tissues, and on water quality issues related to the exceedance of uranium in water using the Safe Drinking Water Act. We are very honored to have each of you here today and um, really are welcome um, you here and really appreciate the time and energy of speaking. So during these talks, please for the participants uh, who registered, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A box on your screen. After everyone has spoken, Dr. Goins, Pam, and I will present one question at a time for the speakers. This event is recorded and can be shared with all registrants who are interested. Uh, there's also a thumbs up button uh, that if you see a, a question that has already been asked, uh, you can uh, hit that thumbs up, that means that it votes that that question be asked. So now I'd like to present Dr. Anna Navasa Shin. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everybody, at least for all of those of you on the East Coast. And uh, it's a tremendous honor uh, to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much uh, to Western Carolina University for this invitation. Thank you, uh, Lisa Leffler, for your outstanding introduction of the whole panel. And, uh, and also Turner, uh, Goins and Pam Myers for making this possible. Also, thank you to all the panelists. It's a tremendous honor for me to be uh, talking today. And uh, with, with the panelists that we have, it's, it's an incredible honor. So what, what I thought I would like to talk before we start debating and really thinking more broadly about water issues in, in native communities is I, would I wanted to focus it and narrow it down. I wanted to start thinking about health and in particular cardiovascular health, then discussing issues related to water in very particular metal contaminants and why are they important in, metal in native communities? 
and then put those two together. Do we have evidence, scientific evidence, that these metals might be harmful for the communities? And then I want to think that we all start thinking together about solutions and interventions. What can we really do? Because that's really cr the, critical, uh, the critical point. So I am going to start, as I said, talking about cardiovascular disease. Oh, sorry, my app, uh, sorry, now, uh, one second. I am, um, I, want, I am going to start talking about um, cardiovascular disease because this is the, the most important cause of death and morbidity in uh, American Indian communities uh, and native communities in general, more broadly, as, as shown by the statistics. But not only that, also, Cardiovascular disease is occurring more prematurely, it's occurring earlier uh, in native communities compared to other uh, population groups in the United States. They also represent, according to some estimates, 18% of all cardiovascular disease deaths in the country. When the native population, the American Indian population in the United States is less than 2%. So there is a real uh, disproportionate burden of cardiovascular disease. And this can be seen very clearly here in some data from the Strong Heart Study, which is a study uh, that I am going to be talking and referring to quite a bit during this presentation. And in this slide, with a very landmark paper, very important, now a little bit uh, like 20 years old, but still very important. What they found is that in the Strong Heart Study, compared to ARIC, which is a study that includes uh, African-American and, and white participants in the United States, very, very similar studies. The stronger study participants has doubled the risk of cardiovascular disease, of coronary heart disease. This is very sobering. And with the accumulation of evidence of the importance of cardiovascular disease in American Indians and Alaska Native communities, the American Heart Association for the first time issued a scientific statement uh, indicating the importance of cardiovascular disease and talking about all the, all the relevant uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including especially very important diabetes, cholesterol, hypertension, tobacco, and also other issues extremely relevant, the social determinants of health, including discrimination, insurance, income, uh, wealth, but it also included toxic metal exposure. And the reason for including the metals is because of the evidence that we have uh, available on the importance of metals in communities that are uh, exposed to them. So when we think of interventions for cardiovascular disease, most, time, most of the time we tend to think of lifestyle interventions. We think of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, of exercise, uh, smoking, quitting smoking, improving your diet. We think about treating your sugar, your glucose, uh, treating your cholesterol, measuring your blood pressure. And those are really, really important things to do. However, we are acknowledging more and more today that environmental elements are also very important. And in the guidelines from the American Heart Association, which are called A, B, C, C, D, D, E, I would like to propose that we need to add an additional E for environment. We need to protect our air that we breathe. We need to protect the water that we drink. And that's going to be essential for all communities to have a healthier uh, lives and to have reduced the burden of cardiovascular disease. So I am going to now focus on water, which is a major uh, theme of today. And I want to bring this, uh, this um, uh, statement from borrowing the language, the beautiful language of the Lakota people, Miniwichani, which means water is life. And I want to bring this map of the US, forgetting about states, forgetting about other geographical elements and just looking at the surface water of the country. And you can see the Missouri River, how important it is, how major it is crossing all across uh, from the north and then joining the Mississippi River to the south. And Mini Wichoni was, was the motto, the, 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 the uh, mission that really moved uh, the Standing Rock tribe in their uh, fight, in their protest. 
against the Dakota, uh, the Dakota pipeline. So, so this, this was, this really, this map showed how water is important and how for native communities, protecting water is, is really essential and is part, is part of who they are. And, and also the map gives us this picture of surface water, but another element that is very important is that there are many communities that actually don't rely on, on surface water so much, but they are relying on groundwater. So I want to bring the picture of the country thinking about groundwater. And to think about groundwater, I am bringing this map from the USGS, uh, the US Geological Survey. And it's a map that uh, uh, shows the probability of arsenic levels being higher than 10 micrograms per liter. And 10 micrograms per liter is the maximum contaminant level uh, through by the EPA. This is the level at which nobody should be drinking in the country. And, but private wells are not regulated. So this is telling us what, which parts of the country are affected. And there are clear disparities west, east for arsenic, with, although some parts of the northeast are also affected and some parts of the Midwest are also affected and the central Midwest, the Great Plains are also affected. So, so this, is, this is very in, in interesting for us to think about these issues, surface water, uh, groundwater, and arsenic being a major element of concern. And when groundwater is contaminated, many public water systems which rely on groundwater are also going to be contaminated. And putting together the data from the EPA six-year review contaminant occurrence data set, uh, Annie Nigra, Dr. Nigra, just a recent graduate from Columbia University, she put together this map only looking at public water and looking at arsenic concentrations. And you can see many counties around the country, especially in the western part of the, of the country, are still having levels with the most recent data that we have from the EPA nationwide. Uh, they are still having levels higher than 10 micrograms per liter there are still public water systems that are not protected. And so who are those community water systems that are not protected? Before the MCL was implemented in the year 2000, uh, there was a big concern for uh, tribal communities about how they were going to implement the new MCL, which was enacted in 2001. And David Harvey, Captain David Harvey, who works at the, who is a major uh, leader in uh, water uh, at, at the uh, treatment and uh, at the Indian Health Service. He, at the time, was actually doing a Master of Public Health and he put together this table and estimated that 16% of tribally owned community water systems were above the MCL, the new MCL versus only 4% of the overall US population. So that was a substantial disparity. This was in the year 2000. So you may wonder, maybe things have changed. Maybe now uh, tribal communities are protected in their community, in their tribal uh, water systems. And it's, it's true, things have changed and I am going to show you some numbers. But when you look at the numbers, what we found, I am showing here again, taking the data from the EPA, the most recent nationwide EPA data uh, available from uh, 2006 to 2011. And you can look at the mean arsenic in micrograms per liter. The mean is clearly below 10, but a mean also, also tells, gives you a hint of what's happening at the higher levels. And you can see that in American Indian uh, rural count, counties, and this is based on some class, classification that it's available in a paper there if you're interested in seeing how. So some of the counties that are classified are predominantly uh, American Indian uh, counties because of the population living in those counties, have the second highest uh, level of arsenic in their water, following only the Hispanic uh, counties. And I am going to, I want you to ignore all the other counties. I want to focus on the Hispanic and the American Indian counties. And this was, these data are for 2006, 2008, the first years, very rapid, very following the new MCL, which had to be implemented following 2006. 
But if we go to 2009 to 2011, uh, we can see that the levels have gone down. Actually, even a little bit, maybe more, relatively speaking, for the American Indian counties. And we can see that there has been a decline that in relative percentage is, can be considered of 15.1%. So these are good news. We are in the right trajectory. At the same time, if you look at counties that are still uh, not compliant, the counties that are like uh, predominant classified as American Indian counties have an odds ratio are 2.43 times more likely to be non-compliant compared to the other counties in the country. So there are good news, but arsenic exposure at the levels above the MCL are still important and a problem in several uh, counties that are predominantly uh, American Indians and the same for Hispanic counties, showing, highlighting that this is a major disparity that still seeks today in the country. But arsenic is not the only uh, contaminant, it's not the only mineral uh, in the water, in the groundwater. In a, using data from the Stronghold study and comparing to MESA, studying urban uh, uh, cities, as it was uh, mentioned by, by Lisa at the beginning, and I worked with quite a lot with these two studies, we found that arsenic levels were higher in the Stronghold study participants. This is measured in their urine. This is no longer what's in the water. This is what's in the people. What they've, what they've been drinking, what's happening, how it's going through their bodies, how it's excreted through the urine. And we found that arsenic, tungsten, and uranium were higher. These three metals were higher. And when we did some type of clustering analysis, which is an untargeted way to see which things come together, the three metals came together, arsenic, tungsten, and uranium. And we hypothesized that this is because it's coming through the water, because these metals are co-occurring and they're happening at the same time. And this, this was not totally new. Other people have uh, found similar findings, other studies. And I want to bring here the work done by our colleagues, Jose Manuel Serrato and others from the University of New, of New Mexico, where they found the same that uranium was co-occurring with other metals, with, including arsenic in the urine. And in their uh, case, in this work done with the Navajo uh, Nation, uh, abandoned urine mines were really relevant in making that happening. So it's not only the naturally occurring groundwater issues, but it's also what we've done to the land, how we've mined the land, and how we've facilitated the uh, distribution and the transport of these toxicants uh, through the water and the soil. And uh, so if you look at that, you can see how uh, the mining and uh, communities, uh, how they, they, in this map, you can see the uh, brown uh, dots and areas show you uh, uh, the density of abandoned uh, mines. And again, you can see that there are an enormous amount of abandoned mines happening in many parts of the, of the, of the western part of the country. So, so this is creating a, a, a source of disparities in, a, in, in native communities. And you can see again, this is, I am bringing you the similar map with community water systems for arsenic before, but now for uranium, using again the EPA uh, six year review contaminant occurrence data sets for the period of the year 2000 to 2011, which is what's available for uranium. And we can see again that uranium is common and actually it's above 30 megagrams per liter on average in many states. So this is again, this, there's an issue, there's a problem with uranium contamination in community water systems, not only in private wells. And this is something that I think it's not always, uh, uh, commonly uh, people are not always aware that this is actually happening. So we have arsenic, we have uranium, we have other metals. I, talked, I told you earlier about cardiovascular diseases, the risk factors. So what do we know? What do we know? How are they truly tribal communities affected by these metals? So we know that many metals are risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but I, want to, I am going to focus on arsenic because it's the metal for which we have the best evidence, especially in Native American communities. 
And, and arsenic is an important uh, metalloid to focus because it's the number one toxicant in the uh, classified by the, by the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry at the CDC. Uh, it's the most because it's so widespread, because it's very toxic, in particular for the uh, heart, for cardiovascular disease. And we've had historically a lot of data from populations in Taiwan, Chile, Bangladesh, at very high levels. And the data from Taiwan have been used and are for the, the MCL that we have in place right now, uh, 10 micrograms per liter. We have data from animal models. We have mechanistic information. But what do we know at the levels that communities in the US are exposed to, rural communities in the US are exposed to, American Indian communities are exposed to? So to answer this question, it's not possible to do this as scientists alone. There is no way. To answer this question, you need to be part of the community. You need to be in the community. You need to work together with the communities. And this is going to be a team's effort. And so we were extremely fortunate to be able to partner and work together with the Strong Heart Study. And this is a picture in, uh, in, in South Dakota, in uh, Eagle Butte, where we meet once, we meet every year in each community, the whole team. And in the Soho study, there are communities from Arizona, from North and South Dakota, and also from Oklahoma. And each community is different. Each community has different issues, different concerns, but they all come together for the Soho study and, and they make decisions together. And one of the concerns that we had was arsenic, because when you look at the map, of the USGS data at the groundwater arsenic, and you overlap with where the, the states, where the tribes for the software study are located, you can see that there is substantial variability. Sometimes levels are extremely high, sometimes levels are low. And we could see that in the data here from our participants, which is the, the plots there, which I am going to skip a little bit in the benefit of time. So we could confirm that arsenic exposure was, was an issue for these communities. But as I said earlier, to, to do science, to do high quality science, you cannot, you cannot do this alone. And I am, I am borrowing here some uh, uh, statements from Spiro Manson, who is one of the top uh, Native American scientists in, in the country. And he, he talks often about how tribal communities work in a collective manner through collective competence. And especially authority is fruit in collective competence. And decision-making is horizontal and leadership is shared and how tribal communities are socio-centric. And I think this is really important and it, it fits well how we should be doing science. Because in science, we need to have collective competence. We need to partner together across different disciplines. But not only that, it's not only doing the science, the exposure assessment, the epidemiology, understanding the mechanisms, the toxicology, understanding how our genes might change effects and how understanding behaviors and how we can make real changes doing interventions. It's not only that, the scientific disciplines, but it's really working together in partnership and with real trust with the communities in a sustainable manner. So the Sohar study is a tremendous example of research working through this model. And they started in the late 80s and they're still working today with these communities across four different states, 13 tribes, 12 tribes still engaged today. And so what we did to be able to answer the question on arsenic and cardiovascular disease is that we measured arsenic in the urine samples that were collected initially for the study. So the samples were collected in the late 80s and 90s, and then in the, uh, the early 2000s. So we went back in 2006 and went back to the freezers where the precious samples had been stored with a lot of respect and care. And we took the samples and measured the arsenic. So now we were able to know for all of these individuals who had been participants in the Songhar study, which were their exposure levels. And we were able to see what happened to their heart disease over the th time. And then when we make those connections, unfortunately what we found was that the higher your arsenic at the beginning of the study, 
the higher your risk for cardiovascular disease. So compared to the people who have the lowest arsenic, less than 5.8 micrograms per gram of creatinine to account for uh, dilution, we could see a clear dose response. We could see a clear uh, increased risk. Sometimes you wonder, maybe there was something wrong. We did something wrong. The study was not representative. And, but a few years later, in a rural part of Colorado, and these were uh, white participants and Hispanic participants in Colorado, they found the same increased risk. Also, people with the highest levels of exposure had higher risk of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease. So this showed consistency. And also, if you try in an animal model where you can really control all the potential biases, and in an animal model that use levels of exposure that are very similar to what the people in our communities are drinking, we could see clearly how atherosclerosis, which is the underlying, is the thickening of the arteries because there is a problem, and, and that's an early development to cardiovascular disease, the animal model developed more of this uh, early disease for cardiovascular disease. So showing very, very consistent findings. We wanted to see not only disease, sometimes disease happens very late in life or you know, as, we, as we age, but we can start seeing preclinical problems already early in young adults. So we went to the, our strong heart family study, which recruited the, the younger uh, siblings and the younger uh, children, the offspring of the, uh, of the elders, which were in the original cohort. And we look at the function of their heart. And we can do that with an ultrasound. You can look at the, take an image of the chamber of the heart. You can see how it works. You can see how thick the different walls are. When your wall, when your heart needs to work harder because it's, it's just harder uh, uh, because maybe your blood pressure is higher, then it starts to get thick. And that can have many complications down the road, many cardiovascular complications. And again, in these young people, we could see that the higher the arsenic, the thicker was your heart. So there was an editorial at the time uh, saying arsenic is a metal that might break your heart. And, and it's really highlighting the, the importance of, of these findings. And we found many other findings. We published many different papers going very, very difficult, carefully, and also even looking at other outcomes, such as cancer and some cancers. And we also found some associations with cancer. But, you know, we need to think of solutions as I want to talk, and also mechanisms. Why is this happening? So one of the mechanisms could be uh, epigenetics. Oops, and, and this is, uh, epigenetics is, is related to gene expression, and that means how the genes are functioning. And one way of uh, thinking about epigenetics is to imagine that your DNA is like a book. It's like a big code, but you don't want to read the whole book. That will be a mess. You want to read the, the, what's important for each chapter, and you can imagine that each chapter is a different types of cells. Some are your blood cells, some are your liver cells, your muscle cells. And so you need to read different sections of the book. You need to highlight different sections. So that's what epigenetics is doing. And so we are looking into epigenetics. I'm going to skip this, this slide because of benef the benefit of time. And we can, th these epigenetics are very helpful and we have some research going on showing that we can actually increase our ability to predict who is at risk of cardiovascular disease through uh, the measure of epigenetics. So this is kind of complex science and, uh, and, and looking using, again, DNA from uh, which were collected a long time ago in a very, stored in a very respectful manner and, and always with the approval and, and agreement from, from the communities to do this, this work which we hope uh, can be used to benefit them. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. I am going to skip the role of genetics, which is also very important, because I really want us to start thinking about the data that we have, who owns it, how do we share it with others, in which terms do we share the data, the raw data with others. 
and also who benefits about science because this is something that never nobody taught me this when i did my phd in the early 2000s this is not something that at the time people were discussing much in science we kind of people like assume that that was a good thing to share data but by working with the tribal communities i am extremely grateful and i've been really humbled because the tribe, the tribes from the Stronghold study have, and many others also, have made scientists think more carefully about data ownership. And in the Stronghold study, the tribes own the data. They make the decisions of when the data can be used and in which terms. And that, that's very important. It's not me as a scientist. It's not my institution, Columbia University. It's not the NIH who owns the data the tribes on the data. And it's by working together that we make decisions about how we use the data. So we want to use the data very well. We want to use the data well, because who's profiting from the research that we are doing? We need to, to keep that in mind. It's very important. So I want to bring again this, this uh, concept of the tribal communities restricting, uh, resisting or restricted data sharing, so that it's done in a way that is well, they don't have anything to say. Most of the tribes that I work with are, are okay with sharing data, but not in just in a non-restricted manner. They want to be part of it. They, need, they want to be the ones who make the decision. And I think about this, it makes me think about how uh, the Standing Rock tribe defended the water in South Dakota, defended the Missouri River, preventing contamination from oil from the Dakota uh, pipeline and the Dakota Access Pipeline. And, and so, so this, is, this is why I, I am very, I really valued this work and how much I am learning because understanding of how we need to protect the data in an equal way as how we protect our natural resources. And there is now uh, last year, a, a new a data transparency rule released by the EPA that mention uh, that we would only be able to use um, data when if the data had been shared. So this is showing you how contentious this issue of data sharing is. It's very contentious. But the idea that the indigenous communities, that native people must benefit from science is really growing and it's very important. It's not, it's not okay for us scientists to do science and us to benefit, companies to benefit, the government to benefit because the better decisions they are able to make with the science that we provide, that's not okay. If the communities who participate in that science are not benefiting, this is not okay. So the focus on solutions is extremely important. And now in this scientific statement from the American Heart Association, which was released uh, just recently, and, and I mentioned earlier, there is a big focus on thinking of solutions, prevention, providing the interventions that the community needs, updating the clinical guidelines so that we have the best possible treatment and prevention opportunities for the communities. And uh, thinking about water again, and thinking about how we can contribute, how our data can contribute showing the risk, I think it's very powerful for instance, at the regional level, to see how we can increase resources, how we can provide, plan better prevention strategies. And one example I want to bring is the um, Miniwichoni uh, water uh, pipeline, which reached the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, the Ogallala Sioux tribe, in uh, around 2008. And this was a tremendous effort, and I am so glad that uh, green or red cloud from the Ogallala Sioux Tribe Water and Natural Resources Program is here today because he can actually tell you all the insights of how this happened. But this was a tremendous accomplishment that gave water from the Missouri River to the, to the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. So this is, this is extremely important. However, not everybody has benefited from this pipeline, from this water pipeline. And there are still uh, people who rely on private wells and don't have a connection to the community, to the safe arsenic 
uh, water from the from the uh, Visuri River. So for that reason, we develop a, an intervention study that is called the Strong Heart Water Study. And as part of the, the name, actually, it's Green or Red Cloud gave us that name. And, uh, and as part of that study, we are working with the, in the Dakotas. We are installing water filters to remove arsenic. We are providing an education to, the, to families versus a simpler education to see uh, what's needed. How can we do this better? And, and you can see a, a picture of the filter here. This is a faucet that has now the clean water, the arsenic free water. It's, it's been a very exciting. We've installed uh, 100 uh, filters uh, so far. So this, or sorry, 60 uh, filters so far, and we have more than 150 participants in the study. And the study is led by Christine George, who is a faculty member at Johns Hopkins University together with Marsha O'Leary from uh, Missouri Breaks in, in South Dakota, who is a, a major organization doing local uh, research with the, with the tribe. And uh, we have a, a, a framework to think about the study and how we go about the interventions, thinking carefully about what are the critical elements at the individual level, the household level, the community level, also the tribal, the tribal uh, issues, water rights, who can access which water and when, and also the federal uh, structural issues that are, are extremely important. Who is in charge or fixing the water? What's the role of the Indian Health Service? How does the tribe and the Indian Health Service work together? As scientists, as the tribal members part of the study, we've all, as the Indian Health Service, all of us working together, we've had to deal about all of these issues. But that's the only way through this collective uh, competence. So the partnership is essential, and I have these pictures here from how we started discussing. You can see a lot of thinking together, working together, planning the study together, and Reno Red Cloud is here uh, together with other members from the different agencies at the Ogallala Sioux Tribe, which were uh, involved in planning the study. So, so really exciting to work together, thinking about solutions. I think it's, it's, it's powerful. But I want to finish saying, that water is not the only problem, and arsenic in water is not the only problem, or even uranium there or, or, or other metals. There are many other problems that we are facing. Fracking is here, other contaminants in water, waste management, uh, soil pollution, many uh, other uh, issues. And we really need to think comprehensively about these environmental uh, problems. So I want to finish with, again, bringing back the slide about how do we prevent cardiovascular disease in, in tribal communities and in communities at large in the US and in many other countries. And I think it's really time to think that we need to add E for the environment. We need to take care of our environment if we want to have good cardiovascular health. So I want to thank to finish the communities and the participants who make research possible, especially in the Stronghold study participants, the Stronghold water study participants, only through their engagement and participation and their support to science, this is possible. They have to contribute to research questions. They need to be engaged and they have to be part of conducting the research. And us, as scientists, we need to think about how the communities have to benefit at the same time, we need to be honest that benefits sometimes are slow, but we have an obligation to remain engaged. So I want to thank the funding, it's extremely important, especially the NIH, and that has really uh, been very generous in making this research sustainable over time. And also there are so many scientists and so many organizations to thank that I thought the best way to thank is through the students because the students really drive the science forward. And many, I am listing students who finished a long time ago. Some of them have pursued amazing careers. Some are more recent students, such as Kevin Patterson, who is just, it's an Abajo student and he's an MPA, just started this uh, last year. Now he's starting it's his second year. And we are just so delighted and fortunate to have these uh, students partnership also with the communities. And with this, I want to finish and uh, stop sharing my slide and 
uh, welcoming now the panelist members to respond, bring many other issues. I'm sure there are so many things that I left out that I would love if they can bring them in. And, uh, and then also at, at some point, I hope that we'll also get the questions from the participants. So thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much. Um, we appreciate that. It was a very informative uh, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions come in. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Tom, uh, Dr. Tommy Rock to um, uh, respond, if you will, and um, give us your perspectives of what uh, is going on and, and how are you working in your community as well. I um, let me introduce myself in Navajo as well for my Navajo audience. Yate, Kasin Elo, Tamarok, and Shedo, or Jet Tolinasha, and I should don't know, not that she's not so much she's not a genius as a Jedo, look at me, that she's not a day in Nashla. I left University of Utah, I'm not doing my postdoc at University of Utah anymore. I came back to the reservation. I'm here back in. My home community, and my name is Bali, and working with grassroots organizations to address some of their environmental concerns as well. So I've um, been doing that just early starting. So I'm, I'm pretty excited, pretty stoked, and it's, it's different, but I'm looking forward to it. It's like uh, something that's personal and something that, um, something that, does, uh, that drives me. So um, I'm, Going out and doing something entirely different than following the the, the regular um, paradigm of, of pursuing or or uh, after you do your, your doctor degree, so it's usually postdoc and then university or what have you. But I'm excited, pretty stoked about this as well. Uh, this is a well that people use. Uh, this is in in Ojeto. Um, Next slide. Hello? Oh, this slide, I, want, I wanted to show you what um, Anna was talking about, about other contaminants as well, not from, so not just, um, focusing on arsenic, but um, all the triangle or, or passing away in mines and some of those little circle dots or wells that have been shown to be elevated in uranium and other contaminants as well. So, like, um, there's a lot more of these now. Um, a lot of these sampling was done by University of New Mexico, then at college, um, Northern Arizona University, like Dr. Jenny, uh, Dr. Jenny Ingram's research team, which I was a part of. And USCP and CDC did a lot of sampling as well. So the big gap that was missing was on the western side. And there's um, where the circle is, that's where there's fracking happening. There's the Chaco Canyon. There's um, also um, um, cultural significant site there, Chaco Canyon, for, for Navajos and for the public tribes in Mexico as well. And up in the oil and gas fields, up in northern Utah, there's a bunch of um, oil, oil and gas fields. And there's some wells, test wells, for, for oils that uh, people are using um, for their livestock and for irrigation. There's a picture on the next slide that I'll show you, but also other issues such as um, gases from these oil and gas fields. And I wish I, I had a picture of a um, inverse pollution that happened um, last year and I wish I, I saved it where I can easily access it, but I, I, I didn't manage to do that. But to the right hand is like where the um, test drill for the oil was, and people are using that. And in the background, you can see a corral, horse corral. There's horse corral, there's some cattle in that area. And on the other side of this picture, there's some home just nearby that are using this for their ag um, agriculture, their, their little farm plots. And to the left is wells that, um, the hand pump well that people do use um, and still use in some um, rural 
isolated areas on Navajo Nation. This is a hand pump well to the left hand side, and um, and also is like I want to go back and show you that the the mix of mix issue of contamination, like from heavy heavy metal, petroleum, and now fracking as well, and also um, pollution such as like uh, from um, oil and gas fuel, like hydrogen sulfides, um, sulfide dioxide, and benzenes, and there's more other more contaminants as well. So my site is basically just a, a, a brief introduction of other pollutants as well that's happening on Navajo, and I'm and I'm pretty sure that's happening in other tribal community as well. Next slide. And this slide just shows you with the COVID-19, what the, my trap has done. Um, all the red dots are existing public water wells and the blue dots are new wells that are being put in place. And I just wanna show you that some of these red dots, some of these waters, public water system, um, they're not big enough to, to support um, the community at times, especially in time of drought, especially during the summer, where they have to turn off the regulated watering point. So people are turned away and they're forced, or they have to go to these um, unregulated watering points to get their water as well. Like um, some, some cases are pretty high in arsenic or uranium or, or what have you. So it's still an ongoing issue. And I had to take COVID-19 to really um, highlight this um, issue of of um, the lack of um, public water system, a uh, part of the water for the community well, for, for Navajo Nation. And that's, that's about all I got. Thank you, Dr. Rock. That's, um, it's always startling to me. It's horrifying actually to see all of contamination that exists there and it must um, make life very challenging uh, for all of you. We, we um, think of you and think of your folks in that part of the country uh, often uh, dealing with that. But thank you. Um, uh, I guess next, uh, maybe Heather uh, Gregory from uh, works with the EBCI um, water uh, waste treatment plant. Would you like to contribute your? Sure. So uh, my name is Heather Gregory. I'll just introduce myself. I went to, I got my bachelor's at Western Carolina Uni excuse me, University in geology. And I went to graduate school at Coastal Carolina University in coastal marine and wetland studies. And I moved back up here to North Carolina and I've been working here for the tribe for eight years now. And um, in the eight years that I've been here working with water, I think some of the biggest contaminants I've seen in our water supply are probably nutrient, the nutrients we get from agriculture and runoff, such as um, big into nitrates, which I know can, if you have some something like cardiovascular disease or or diabetes or something like that you can make you more susceptible to some of the things that it can cause especially for babies they have something called methemoglobinemia which is basically it's called blue baby syndrome T causes them to turn a bluish color and it, and it can it can kill them but um we have some areas not just on the reservation but we the tribe owns land little parcels of land all throughout the western part of the state in different counties and there are some areas out there where the, some of the farmers allow their animals to wade in the streams and now that just that doesn't just cause nitrate and nitrite and phosphorus but then you have the problem of E. coli contamination. And there's, there's some sites there in, especially in Murphy and the Andrews area that are um, not safe. They're not safe to, to drink out of, or I wouldn't even swim in some of them. But um, 
we have had a problem at Islands Park here on the reservation. Mainly in the summertime, it gets real bad. Um, like when you get lot when we get lots of tourists. We haven't really had as many tourists because of COVID, really, and everybody's just kind of staying home and staying with their families. But we we still have some, and you see a spike in that, and um, that really we do a yearly a yearly what we call a bioassay. And we test for a whole bunch of other different contaminants, um, arsenic included and uranium. And really, they come back either negligible or they don't come back with anything at all. So that's not a, that's not a problem here. And um, the water here by the plant is really, the water coming here out of the plant is really clean. We just did a nutrient study last year of, um, total nitrogen and total phosphorus and the water here was really clean. So that's really, that's about all I've got for, uh, for that. Well, thank you, Heather. We appreciate it. Uh, we're very, You're welcome. we're very fortunate uh, to be here in the land where water, water is plentiful uh, for sure. Yes. It's a beautiful area. Um, Mr. Red Cloud, would you like to, I know that you've worked with uh, Dr. Nava Sashin, so what, what would you like to offer in that regard? Yeah, I'd probably like to give you a little history of, you know, not with working with the Ross tribe over here and then uh, leading up to working with Anna on them in 2015. I worked for the tribe in the water programs from 1978, right? And now I'm an OST, Oklahoma Sioux Tribe Water Resource Department Administrator, but um, I spent a lot of my years being a water operator for the community water systems in the 80s, 90s. I am certified under the state of South Dakota in cloudy water treatment water distribution, class one wastewater collection. Uh, but most of my, ex I could offer is my experience that I've worked. I worked, I started with the Mini Wachoni in 1994 at the operation and maintenance department. And I worked with them clear until 2010. I was 11 years as a field supervisor and five years as a director of operation and maintenance with them. but. Just a history on the Mini Wachoni. Back in the 80s, when I worked with uh, the 14 community systems on the reservation, Pine Ridge, where there's various geography here, north of us, you can go north on the reservation, and we have the Badlands over there, and that's impermeable soil that's, you know, it's arid, semi arid, and the water quality is very bad up there on the northern part. And then you get to the south of our reservation and you have the Ogallala Aquifer, which is one of the greatest aquifers in the United States. So there's an abundance of water and the water quality uh, varies. So southern part, you got good uh, water. Then the northern part, you have issues with water quality with the arsenic and then uranium, radionuclides, nitrates, but um, that was the big issue back in the 80s. It got to the point that our tribe identified it and assessed it. And it had, something had to be done. So they got together with, not only with the Indian tribes, they got uh, together with the non-Indians non in the Western South Dakota. So not only in Pine, uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, the many which is three reservations and. Um, project rural water system is three reservations and seven non-Indian West River counties that make up this project, but uh, it was a collaboration between the, the native and uh, non-Indian working together to create the Mini Wachoni. The Mini Wachoni project was uh, an authorization of Congress in 1988. It's an act that passed through and the, the surface water comes from Fort Pier, the Missouri River treated and then it comes down into Lower Brule, Rosebud, Ogallala Sioux Tribe, and then it goes into West River, Lyman Jones, Lyman uh, 
Jones, Hawk, uh, you know, seven different counties that are affected because of water quality issues. Yeah, the, um, the Mini Wachone is a godsend in my eyes as a water water operator. And back then, when I when I did get my first um, working experience with the Safe Drinking Water Act, I did sample for uh, you know different contaminants. And I do know that the arsenic level at one time was 50 parts per billion. Now it dropped to 10. So it, you know, things got more restrictive. The regulations got more restrictive. And the mini Wachoni did supply, I'd say maybe 75% of the reservation. That's just my calculation, but uh, there's still the private well sector. And that's, that was, I'm glad that at that time in 2015, the Strong Heart Water Study came in and took a focus on our private wells and did their testing, their research, and that helped us identify a lot of the wells, the problem areas where water quality was of issue, which was arsenic. And they, they did their research and identified the wells, did their testing, and they did a, a good focus for us on the tribe for helping us out with uh, identifying the levels of arsenic that um, were of concern. And part of their project's um, focus too was identifying it and, and recommending that the people that were close to the pipeline, that there is a long-term solution that they could uh, request getting onto the pipeline from their private wells. So it was a great effort, it still is. Um, I'm glad that I was a part of it. I was a part of them in 2015. I was a consultant then and then I'm, I'm still here to, to help them out. So but I, I do see the need for water and I'm, I'm, we have the mini with Joni and that, I think that is um, on Pine Ridge, we have 50% surface water, 50% groundwater. So there's still that need for uh, testing the water and then with the uh, strong heart water study putting filters in there for now and then looking at trying to get them hooked up to the mini which only eventually so, or different other alternatives but this is a great project and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Reno so much for the expertise that you bring as well and the experience that you've had. Um, one of the things that I think is just important to note is that even though we may not see ourselves here in this, in our uh, part of the country here in Western North Carolina, as having uh, tremendous water issues, uh, there, there are uh, a lot of things that we need to consider. How do we maintain good water quality here? How do we um, keep uh, others from appropriating uh, water uh, from other regions? This was an issue a few years back with the big drought in Georgia. Um, and we have issues of contaminants in water. Um, we uh, at Rooted in the Mountains uh, later in this month, uh, we'll have Jerry Miller, who is one of the lead uh, experts in Dead Rivers, uh, be able to talk uh, about that issue in working with dead rivers and, and trying to recoup those rivers. So in every region, I think, of the United States, there is increased concern about the safety of our water. Of course, of national interest was Flint, Michigan, of course, and the issues that they still face up there. Uh, but fracking has been an issue uh, for many years here. We uh, been very concerned about fracking uh, coming to this neck of the woods uh, as it has uh, in Oklahoma and in uh, Arizona and New Mexico and, and uh, up farther north uh, on, the, on the eastern coast. So we just want to bring in people from uh, native communities because I have in working for so many years, I really understand that Native people have um, in experiencing very high health disparities, high rates of health disparities, they really have done more with so much less than about any other 
um, communities that I'm aware of. And so we can learn a lot from uh, neighbor, Native uh, communities about how they're addressing these issues, uh, how they um, utilize their own language and culture as part of that solution and understanding what, what to do. Uh, but it also allows us to see just how important it is to um, be aware of each other's struggles. I know we, we work with um, um, uh, folks up in uh, Alaska. Uh, we had a meeting uh, from the Smithsonian folks here at WCU a few years ago. And uh, Rosemary, and I can't even pronounce her last name, uh, is a Nupik and is a nurse there in her community in Barrow, Alaska. And they have been fighting for many, many years uh, contamination from the oil and gas industry. Uh, in her community, she's seen many community members die. Um, and so there are these, these um, communities that have been fighting these issues for many years. And uh, I think we, we should be aware, we need to continue to be aware and continue to keep a dialogue um, between all of these communities uh, in addressing this because it affects ultimately, it affects all of our health. Uh, and we have that responsibility, I think, to one another. But um, what, uh, what we'd like to do now is if we have any questions, I'd like for maybe uh, Dr. Goins uh, and Pam to maybe ask some of these questions that are popping up. Okay, great. This is Pam Myers and Dr. Navas. We have one question that has come in. Uh, thanking you for your presentation, but the question is, uh, what kind of filtration process is used to lower the arsenic levels in the drinking water? And what is the maintenance required for it? That, that's a great question. So we are using absorption media and it's a point of use uh, treatment system. Uh, and, and so that requires to replacement. So you need to change it. It depends. It actually depends on how much arsenic there is in the water and how much water you use. But let's say you have to change it every six months to a year. So this can be a burden for the families. And uh, this is a current limitation of our study. For the study, we are providing a, a filter replacement. But now we are trying to work together, think on with Reno and other uh, agents at the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. How do we make this sustainable? And so this is why this is not a final solution. This is like an intermediate solution, connecting to the pipe line to the water pipeline connecting to the community water system would be a more long-term solution maybe also having a better filtering systems that are more affordable more sustainable that's a question for for more science to do and i don't know maybe reno would like to add something about this because i know that that's something that he's been worried yeah that's uh, the filtration units you know the private wells you know, just from my being a former employee of the Minnewatoni, I think the best, probably best avenue is to just get them hooked up to a public water system where the Safe Drinking Water Act is regulated and it is uh, you know, uh, providing a safe and healthy water. But, but the filtration units, that was a concern. Is a, if you're going to have it, then you're going to have to have the maintenance on it because maintenance is a big issue. And, so, you know, at least identify that, okay, this happened. We, we're doing something about it, but we got to have it for a long-term solution too. So, and those are uh, things that we could look forward to, you know, trying to resolve if they can't get, I think there's a, li uh, a distance, a limitation on the mini Wachone where they can go out so far, but then again, maybe there's outside other funding or sources that could help uh, supplement cost to get them hooked up. So, but there's other uh, challenges out there that need to be addressed. And I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, I've been at the OST Water Resources right now. This job I'm at now since 2013. And I took the time off about a year or two ago, but I'm back. But uh, we have two rivers over here. We have the Cheyenne River and the, the White River. 
you know, all around our reservation, we're getting influenced by uranium mining. The Black Hills, uh, up there by uh, Edgemont, South Dakota, right now, they're proposing a uranium mine on up there. There's already an active, um, the uranium mining in the Black Hills will affect the Cheyenne River. There's a, a active uranium mining in Crawford, Nebraska. That's that's affecting our White River. So we're monitoring the levels in our surface water, but it's all around us. It's you know, right now there's naturally occurring levels, but then again there's influences. That's part of our department where I work in now is we got to address these environmental issues and give our our feedback and our public comments on on their tribal consultations to protect and preserve our water. And that's, you know, that's where I'm at now with my position. It's not only for now, but for future generations, because, you know, once this water gets contaminated, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad, it's, it's gonna affect our future and everything too. So there's a big fight out there. And I'm, I'm glad that, um, you know, we're out the groups like this that are uh, identifying, responding and trying to resolve. So. Uh, I just want to just to give you that information too. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Tobo Wolf, for your question and uh, for Anna and Reno responding. Our next question is for all the panelists to respond to. It comes from Liam O'Fallon. Um, all of your talk, all of you talked about community engagement in research and data ownership. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of and strategies for communicating results back to the community residents? I am, I am happy to start very rapidly because I, I didn't mention this enough in my talk. This is essential for the Strong Heart Study. All the papers actually are read by and approved by the tribal IRBs. Of course, that's not the community members. So, but at least the tribes at the leadership level know about all the papers, what is very important. And the second thing we do is we have uh, newsletters that are, I think we have three per year where we summarize in the most, uh, the best, easiest way. For instance, what I showed about the book with the epigenetics, that was what we did to explain epigenetics to our participants in a simple way. And also the last thing we do, which is very exciting, is that we do a research symposium. And, uh, and that takes place often when we do the meetings for the annual meetings among investigators. So then we, and, and sometimes separate it also. And we bring students and we have lots of activities and the, and the tribal members come and high school students come and that we have lots of debate. So that's, so some, those are some of the things that we do. But I would love to hear from Tommy, for instance, how does he translate back the hydrogeological and the geological science? I think that, or Reno and Heather, please. Yeah. Well, it's like one of the research that um, I've been involved in, the one we've done from, um, well, on Navajo, is like we always like to translate the science into Navajo and and since a lot of the elders don't speak English or understand English, we go and um, have someone that's fluent in Navajo and go and interpret the data, interpret the science, what, what that means. So the whole community can be engaged, especially the elders as well. So that's how we do that as well. When we go to meetings, um, for, for us, we have these things called chapter meetings, or like town hall meetings, and they have every month we go and get on their agenda, tell the community what's going on, what, what has happened and what the results are and what that means for the community and they can go and decide how to, how to go about it and address those um, results. And we go back and forth between English and Navajo as well. So it's like, a, it was predominantly just mostly English speaking folks and we would stay with English, but some someone preferred Navajo, then we go back and forth, which, takes longer, but we get our results across. That's how we do that as well. It's like, we'll also have like, I'll give them handouts um, of the slides, the presentation, so they can follow along as well. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, our next question is from Jessica Corey. For all panelists, but maybe Dr. Rock and Dr. Navasashin in particular, um, question is, we've explored how uranium mining contributes to water contamination, but is there also additional contamination, particularly in the Southwest, due to the nuclear test that took place in those areas? I mean, do you want to answer first? The nuclear test that happened, I can go and answer. Um, for, the, for the nuclear test, the bombing from Nevada, there's a big plume that um, drifts across going um, eastwards, like um, Utah, northern Arizona, on to New Mexico and Colorado as well. And in terms of groundwater contamination, I don't know if it did, but, but I do have some relatives and elders that talk about when they were out herding sheep during the summer when the um, bombing was happening or the testing that was happening, there's a, um, a flake of ashes that flew on, flew on, flew on them or, or got on them like, a, like snow. So it was all around them. And also other um, nuclear, uh, other, other things related to nuclear is um, uranium milling. There's um, a couple of uranium milling on Navajo nations, and currently they are, they meaning the regulatory agency, Navajo, Navajo EPA, Department of, Department of Energy, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, US EPA, they're all trying to address the groundwater contamination. And so far, I have not seen any groundwater contamination that's been cleaned up so far. Um, I haven't read about it yet. I don't know if there's one out there, but currently that's still going on. And the tribe and DOE is they're still working on that as well. And I don't know how far along they are, but it's going to take a long time for them to, to address the groundwater contamination from, from the milling, from the former mill sites. Okay, um, if no one else would like to respond to that question, we can move on to the next. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, uh, Robert, Reno, 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 Reno wants to. Sure, my apologies. You know what, first of all, I was, I was gonna respond to Anna's question about, you know, with the communication with the tribes, with the Ogallala Sioux tribe. What I've seen is they're active with communities. I've seen them active with our council people being at their meetings. I see them active with the uh, environmental health technical team because I know Tracy goes to our meetings all the time and does presentations with our environmental programs, especially the water programs. So uh, the communication here on Iron Ridge Reservation, Old Wallace Tribe is very, it's happening and it's, it's, it's uh, the, the project is, is, is very helpful to our, our people. And, um, on the last question with other, uh, like uranium, there are open pit mines from the 1930s and 40s up by Edgemont. Igloo, South Dakota used to be a, like an army camp back then. And that was during World War II and they used a lot of open pit mining up there to get their uranium. And a lot of them uh, pits up there are still open and they're being weathered from the weather going through the open pits and going into our Cheyenne River. So there's still a lot of cleanup that still needs to be done. Like what uh, Tom, Tom was saying, yeah, you know, there's, it's out there, but who's cleaning it up? Then there's a proposed uh, uranium mine going by Edgemont now with, for uh, aquifer drilling. But my question is, has there ever been uh, mining that's done with an aquifer that's ever brought back to its normal status. Not, I don't think that's ever happened. So we, gotta, we just got to be aware and then we got to respond and try to protect our waters. That's where I'm at now, right now with my job. So. Thank you. I was going to respond to the to the community education stuff too. I'm I'm sorry, I kind of blanked out there for a minute, but I was going to say we we usually did town halls, but um, since COVID. 
we haven't really been able to do that. We have been holding council meetings if we if we need to bring anything important to council, but um, really COVID has kind of made it so that we're trying to do everything kind of virtually now, but um, the data we have, we submit through what they call, it's called store it, it's, it's the EPA. Anybody can access it, downloading the data and everything and looking at the data once you download it it's not that easy to read but it's available to the public we also have um, various data stations some pro like probes that measure nitrate pH temperature and, uh, and other things along like the Oconaluffy River and the Takasiti River that are real real time and they're available to the public to look at also we have one from the USGS that is on the USGS's webpage. That is available for the public to look at also. Um, we haven't updated the ones on the Ocon or the Tuck in about a year because the um, gentleman that was doing that was in a, a car accident and he's learning to walk again. So he hasn't been able to go out and ma uh, maintain those stations yet. But we also try to get involved with kids. So like every probably not, I don't think they're going to do it this year but usually it was usually in October when it was nice outside we would get together with like the sixth graders and high school age high school age kids and talk to them about water quality and how to be good environmental stewards and try to try to educate them young so that they know how to be good environmental stewards once they grow older so that's all I got about that Okay, um, we can move on now to the next question. Um, Pamela Haddock had a question. Um, I had it, but I'm not seeing it at the moment. Lisa or Turner, do you see it? Oh, here it is. Um, the question is from Pamela Haddock, has there been testing for prescription drug residue in water sources? Other communities worldwide are finding it is an additional problem for water from rivers downstream from large cities. I mentioned we I responded because I was not sure how much time we would have for other questions, so I started responding. We've done some pilot testing with USGS in both North and South Dakota. In, in the Ogallala, it was approved in uh, 20 homes, I think it was. And, uh, and we've done it in Ogallala, we can only do private wells, but in, in two other communities, we did both private and public water systems. And we included pesticides, medications, other, other organic contaminants, the PFAS class, that is a very important. Unfortunately, we don't have the results yet uh, because of the COVID lab interruptions, but we want to, as soon as we get those results, we want to prioritize which other chemicals beyond their metals are of concern for the communities. And I, I believe other communities might be doing similar efforts. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Robert Sargis. Um, for those of us living elsewhere in the U.S., how can we best, or how can we be the best allies in the fight for clean water? I think being best allies is like, um, um, I know there are some native grassroots organizations that are fighting these pollutants. Uh, I know there are some here on Navajo, there's some up um, towards Reno's area as well, Ogalasu areas like um, um, Defenders of the Black Hills, one of them that I can think of, and there's some more. So these are organizations where you can go and help, help them, and that'll be like a, a starting point 
but uh, getting in contact with one of them and start talking, creating that dialogue will, will start, uh, will, will help you um, get started and start um, making kind of some contribution or helping out the, the tribes fight these, um, fight those uh, environmental issues as well. Uh, can I can I say something on that? Um, right now, this last week, we did have public comments, a deadline that we met over here for uranium mining, for of uranium mining. Then there's one just this past Monday for oil and fracking. But it'd probably be good if you could just stay aware, stay aware of what's going on with your environment. See, what, you know what uh, and projects are around you. Like if there's, a, you know, if you have an interest in protecting your water and your environment, you stay aware and active of what's going to influence your area. Like with us over here, we got uranium mining. We just had public comments that we submitted from the tribe, and then we're requesting a consultation with the tribe and the federal agencies. But uh, just stay aware with your, you know, your concerns of protecting the environment. I know with the EPA regs. I think even on the EPA website, there's, you know, information that there's public comments or, you know, just be aware of these these uh, different events and give your comments and, you know, if it's your position to protect, do it because, you know, this right now with all these issues going on with oil and uranium, you know, we got to be act active in these issues and protect. And you know, that's what we're doing on the tribal level, but it, it, on across the whole. United States, it'd probably be best to, if you're getting into environmental science or if you're education, you know, just be aware of what's going on around you too. Just my uh, input, okay? Thank you. Uh, one last thing I'd like to say about that is that um, I know there's a lot of issues that's going on on, that, on native, native land, native countries in regards to environmental issues, but with with the rest of the country and with um, fracking that's going on and other environmental issues, like um, I always like to think of like um, what makes you think that won't happen to them? They're doing that to us. Is like um, what will stop them from happening to them? I mean, it's like what for example, fracking is like um, they're happening on our res, but it's going to happen there. And there's it's already happened in other another part of the country that are predominantly white. So. I think people need to be more aware of what the federal government's doing in terms of environmental issues as well, because it's going to impact them as well. It's like um, such such policies, such laws as the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, it's going to impact them not now but in the future and their in the future generation as well. Yeah, that's well said, uh, Tommy, and, and you're exactly right. Um, that's very well put. We should indeed be very vigilant uh, to understand what's happening uh, with environmental regulations in our country, for sure. We, they've gone through um, very difficult changes here in the last few years, and we need to stay on top of it and be vigilant, for sure. Um, I'm going to... Um, have to wrap up, but I want to. I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, we really are honored by your taking the time and energy uh, to share your experiences and expertise with us. Um, we're very uh, happy that you were able to do that. We appreciate it. Um, we also apologize to anyone uh, whose questions we did not have a chance to uh, answer, um, but. Um, just know that uh, we are interested uh, in, in your questions and what you have to say. Um, and our, uh, our speakers uh, may be given an option to respond to some of your questions later. But thank you all so much. We appreciate everyone's involvement. We thank you to Dr. Goins um, for his funding from the uh, NI, MH and uh, NIH and appreciate that so that it allows us to have these types of forums. So thanks again. I hope you all are able to uh, tune in um, on the, I think it's Thursday, the 24th of September. 
we will have our rooted uh, seminar or webinar. Um, and I hope y'all can um, check back with us uh, to get the date and time and link for that as well. The topic again will be water. So thank you so much. Um, we appreciate everybody uh, listening and participating and uh, hope you'll think of, uh, think of us and come back next year. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.